Okay, so today I'm going to talk to you about um, some recent results that uh, we are finding about the, you can hear me, the back, okay, um, about the uh, flares in, in blazer light curves. Um, so this uh, large part of this, uh, of the data analysis is being done by uh, Namrata Roy, who is an MSc second year student at Presidency, and uh, also there is some contribution from Shunip Mukherjee, who is a PSC third year student. Okay, so um, Fermilat, as uh, we have uh, realized by now, has uh, revolutionized um, high energy astrophysics. The recently published uh, third source catalog contains uh, more than 3,000 sources. And this is based on four years of observations. And uh, this catalog includes the, re the, the location, uh, some spectral properties, and also monthly light curve, which is uh, relatively new. And out of this, um, there are 1,500, more than 1,500 AGN, which is part of the 3 lakh catalog. And um, some of these are uh, not associated, so we don't know what, which source they are. They are not uh, identified. Among the identified ones, about 98% are blazars. So there are about 1,100 uh, blazars. So this is roughly a, not just an order of magnitude, it's roughly a 1.5 orders of magnitude betterment of the previous uh, sort of sub egret era data. So one of the other things that's going on along with Fermi is uh, multi-wavelength monitoring uh, of some of these blazars, um, which includes uh, TV, I wouldn't say monitoring, but there are TV observations related to Fermi, but there is um, X-ray, optical, many monitoring programs in optical and radio. Some of these have been discussed before, and there is also a SWIFT program to observe uh, Fermi blazars in the X-rays. So one of those that I'll emphasize is the SMARTS uh, blazar monitoring program, which is done by a 1.3 meter telescope situated at uh, Cerro Tololo, Chile. And um, it observes uh, the sources that are currently bright in Fermi. So there is a logarithmic cadence. Things that are flaring in GV right now will be observed every night. Things that have recently done something interesting will be observed, say, every three nights or so. And then if it's not doing anything interesting, then it will be observed every week or every month. And the data are public within a week. And uh, I think one of the novel features of this is, uh, is this that um, they can observe optical and near infrared at the same time with Andycam. So until now, I think they have roughly um, 80 targets. Uh, not all of them have equal sampling. Some of them are very well sampled. Some of them are not. Um, so what we end up with, uh, with this, uh, with Fermi and the multi-wavelength observations, among other things, are these kind of light curves. So you have uh, GV uh, here and uh, an optical. And you can see that they go up and down. There are very large sort of outbursts happening. The, both of these are pretty active sources. And one of the questions, again, among many others uh, that you can ask is, are these flares in general symmetric or that is they go up and down roughly uh, in similar time or um, they are asymmetric? That is, they go up very quickly and then slowly decay. And this is obviously something that you can address with such a, a large data set uh, with, a, with a good statistical significance. So what you do is uh, you say, okay, I'll just I'll fit this with some empirical function, which doesn't, which isn't really very physically motivated. It's just something that you can, so that you can calculate the uh, the rise and decay time scale consistently. And so you fit this function, and you end up with this, and you you make four you have free four four free parameters. You uh, where is the peak? Um, uh, what's the height? and also what's the rise and decay time scale. So you keep all of those free so they can be symmetric or asymmetric based on the data. And then you calculate a symmetry parameter, which is this. So if the, that is zero, that means it's perfectly symmetric. If it's plus one or minus one, that will mean it's strongly asymmetric. 
So then you do that for, uh, for a longer light curve, but then it's not that easy. If you have a long light curve, then what happens is there are flares that are overlapping. So what you do is you take the, so this is not, this has been, this is being done for a while. The first instance was Valtawa in 99, and then many people have done it since then. And the idea is that you fit the biggest flare and subtract that fit out so, so that you can now see the smaller flare. So then you subtract the next biggest flare out and so on and so forth until you sort of get a residue that's, that you are happy with. So then you do this for uh, over a large sample of data. I'll not sort of bore you with this. Uh, um, that, so there are many examples and you can do this for both gamma ray and optical. And you end up with something like this. So you have the symmetry parameter. Um, what's that sample look like? And what you found here is that uh, they are roughly symmetric. So one thing that I didn't mention and should be mentioned is that you can decide what time scales you want to look at. For example, this has been smoothed to about five days, so with the Gaussian smoothing with a five-day uh, bin. What that means is, I mean, you know that blazar uh, variability has, you know, there is variability at different time scales. So you cannot look at all the time scales at the same time because if you are fitting, then if you are fitting even the minute uh, sort of up and down. Then, uh, then the fit becomes, it takes a long time and it doesn't give you very satisfactory results. So, so you have to do it in, in very, keeping in mind various time scales. So in this case, this has been smoothed to five days. So you are not seeing anything that's below five days. Any variability that's happening below five day time scale, you are not seeing when you are doing something like this, when you have smoothed it. So, if, so these were done with that uh, idea. And so what you see is that all the flares that are happening at a time scale longer than five days, they are all mostly symmetric. There are, of course, outliers. But if you look at the sample, um, look at the distribution, uh, many, most of them are within plus minus 0.5, actually within plus minus 0.3. And these are for the, the gamma ray flares. And you do the same thing for the optical. It's, again, the, the, the same thing comes out. that. Flares that, are, um, that have time scales longer than five days are mostly symmetric. What that means physically is that we are not really probing the cooling time scales with these flares. Because the, the general idea is that um, the acceleration will happen almost instantaneously. But then um, if you are the, the cooling time scale for these um, particles that are producing the gamma ray or the optical emission um, could be longer than the instantaneous acceleration. So you would sort of probe the cooling time scale if you are looking at the right time scale flares. But obviously these are not that. So then what are these? Um, these are probably, you are basically probing some, some sort of geometry. So. Um, the fact that, that you are seeing symmetric flares. So there could be many uh, physical situations, but one of the simplest one is have been discussed many times already in this uh, meeting, and that is you have some sort of a standing shock uh, in the jet, and then some disturbance moves through the shock and energizes the particle here. So basically what you see is the, the crossing time scale of this disturbance over this. So when it enters, it starts to rise, and then when it leaves, it then you know, decays. And so you see a symmetric flare, and that's long. Uh, that's more than five days, or uh, it's a long, longish time scale. So now the question is, uh, we obviously, I mean, this is an interesting information that you are, you are probing some sort of a geometry, but uh, we are looking to probe the cooling time scale. So what you can do is, now with Fermi, which couldn't have been done, say, four or five years ago at the beginning of the Fermi mission, is that now Fermi has detected flare, detected um, blazars at a very high flaring state when you can actually take the Fermi data and resolve at few hour time scale. So you are looking at flares that are happening. So flares that are factor of, um, you know, factor of a few, factor of several, um, yet, uh, you, can, you can get time scales of the order of three to six hours on those. So then, 
Um, then you do the same thing, you fit, and um, there are some more examples. Um, and, and you do the same thing, you, you do the fitting, and you end up with the similar histogram, except now you have more sort of positive xi um, flares. And in, in the way it has been defined, this means that this is a fast rise, slow decay process. Obviously, there are some symmetric flares as well, but um, there are quite a few compared to the whole sample that have this asymmetric flare that you expect to see if you are really probing the cooling time scales. So then you, then you get ready to you know, use these time scales and see where, whether you can actually probe some physics, some physical parameter of the jet. But um, turns out that in the literature, um, there are some part of the literature um, who have looked at uh, some of these, not, not all, and said that the cooling time scale for these situations is of the order of minutes. And uh, to be honest, I'm a little puzzled by this. And I'm talking to, to modelers here. Um, and I'm open to uh, discussion. But my, my guess is that you know, they are, um, the, the, the cooling time scale is a function of the, uh, the external photon field. And the external photon field, in turn, is a function of many other parameters. And, um, and they are overestimating the, the UBLR, at least in some cases. And as a result, since there is a longer, the sort of a larger photon field that you then uh, you'd expect, the cooling time scale actually goes down. And then the question is, if these are not cooling time scales, then what exactly we are seeing? And one of the answers is that what we are really seeing is a varying Doppler factor effect. That is, if an observer is right at the center of the jet, that is, the, the angle uh, to the line of sight is, is along the, exactly along the axis. Then you see, and, and there are small emission regions, then all of them are sort of symmetric. But if you are not, if you are looking from one side, so you are within the jet cone, but yet you are not exactly along the axis, then what happens is you are um, seeing some part of the jet much brighter than the, the other regions, and also, um, the light travel time is more for regions that are in other angles. So basically, you will see a flare, a bright flare from here. And then after a little bit of time, you will see slightly less bright flare from these regions, and then even lesser bright flare from these regions after that. So that means that your flares basically becomes, you have a, the, the, the decay time becomes higher and higher. So uh, that's, that's the explanation that, that people have come up with who has you know, said that the cooling time scales are, we are not really probing the cooling time scales. Um, so I'll end with uh, the basic uh, summary that we found. One is that uh, longer than five days, you are definitely not probing cooling time scale. You are seeing some sort of a geometrical effect. Um, less than five days and close to, you know, sub-day time scale, you are uh, probably uh, either probing the cooling time scale so you can start getting into the parameters that, that you can actually have a handle on from these time scales. Or this is a varying Doppler boosting, and we are trying to do some very sort of phenomenological modeling to see if we really get back the asymmetric flares using this. Yeah. I'll end here. Thank you. So you said that uh, it's a geometrical effect. So uh, if it's a, so it depends on the shape and the uh, and of the blob which it is passing through, right? The crossing time scale. It doesn't really depend on the shape that much. It more depends on just the characteristic size, the time scales. It's basically an R by C kind of thing. Um, but uh, I I would, I would assume that if it does depend, then it would could be asymmetric, and you could, I mean. There's no necessity that it has um, to be symmetric. So the I, no, the idea is that you know even if it's a asymmetric shape, um, you know you are entering that zone, and your flares go up, and then you you leave that zone, your flare goes down. So there is, it's not really important whether that particular zone is you know axially symmetric or things like that. I don't think that's that's important. Do we have any other questions? Let me see. Yes, up here. Just a okay. comment that uh, it could
could um, manifest in terms in terms of whether the emission region is cylindrical or spherical because uh, in cylindrical you can make it so that it is asymmetric um, in in the width or the height of the cylinder versus the radius and then that could also add to the asymmetry of the overall light curve profile. So in fact in Sikora et al it was shown that if you, no not Sikora I'm sorry, Sokolov et al, it was shown that symmetric uh, light curves are a, a byproduct of uh, the geometry that you're using. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. So I'm, yes, yeah, so I'm attributing it to light travel time scale. But then, and that can be changed depending on how long or short you're keeping your uh, cylindrical region. So it it comes easier in cylindrical. So aspect. what kind of time scales we are talking about here? So yeah. are you saying days or are you saying sub day time? I'm talking about even in sub day you can get the sub day time scale. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you are saying the sub day time scale could also be instead uh, a geometric effect. It could be, yes. Exactly. So, I mean, what uh, Christo proposed is also a geometric effect, except it's a line of sight thing as yeah. opposed to, yeah. All right. Well, good topic for discussion during the break. Thank you. All right.